Shalom, everybody, and welcome to another Pod for Israel. I'm here with Dr. Golan Broshi. My name is Dr. Seth Postel, and we are continuing in our series of the case for Messiah, an Old Testament defense of the New Testament faith. And today we're actually going to be looking at a passage that has uh, received quite a bit of heat uh, from the anti-missionaries, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And we're going to be asking ourselves, did the gospel writers distort the words of Isaiah 7, 14? So good to see you back, Golan. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you. So let me just kind of set the stage. I'll introduce kind of the issues here. So we actually have two very different translations of the Hebrew text of Isaiah chapter 7, 14. And so we actually have, for instance, a New American Standard mm -hmm. uh, version. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with a child and bear an, an, a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. The JPS, on the other hand, which is a Jewish translation of the Hebrew mm -hmm. Bible, actually says, look, the young woman is with child mm. and about to give birth to a son. And so for a young woman to be pregnant is not so much of a miracle, right? That's normal. Yes. So the, the issue is the definition of that of that girl, Alma versus Betula Correct. in so, Hebrew. So are we, you know, does the original Hebrew word actually mean virgin or yeah. not? So there are two very different translations. And obviously, there are two very different interpretations, right? Yep. So if we look at the New Testament, both in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke, Luke. chapter 1, it's clear that they understand uh, that, that Mir Mary, right, Miriam, is this virgin that is supernaturally pregnant, and that mm -hmm. is a sign that Jesus fulfills this passage. Whereas um, if you look at the Jewish rabbinic interpretations, uh, they would argue, uh, they've got a couple of different arguments. They would say that this woman is is not a virgin, right? It's Isaiah's wife, right? And that mm -hmm. by naming the son Emmanuel, she does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Or others would say that the young woman is Ahaz's wife or his daughter, okay? So, so, so the rabbinic approach would be that the word Alma is for a young young girl, but not, nece not necessarily a virgin, and it doesn't talk about a future prophecy that, that would be fulfilled 700 years, but something that is fulfilled in the next chapter or in the same chapter. Correct. So, and we've got a kind of a, a slide that kind of, kind of summarizes the issue. So here's yeah. the anti-missionary claims against the New Testament. And there are really two. I mean, we could probably add some, but I think the main arguments that the New Testament has twisted or distorted Isaiah 7.14 is first, the Gospels mistranslated uh, the word Alma, the original Hebrew word for Alma is young woman, mm -hmm. is what they argue, and that if Isaiah wanted to say that a virgin is pregnant, they would have used the Hebrew word betula. So he would have used a different word. The different word. So the, the, Matthew basically muddles uh, the, the original word. Secondly, and this is this is another argument, is that Matthew and Luke ripped Isaiah 7.14 out of context. The sign is given to Ahaz, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, it had to have been fulfilled in the days of Ahaz, and the, the sign is that Samaria and Aram would be defeated. So it can't be a prophecy that's dealing with something that happened 700 mm -hmm. years later. So, so let's focus now on the first thing. Yeah. And that's a really important issue. What what does the word Alma actually mean? So in this podcast, I think what we'll do, obviously we're going to address these two concerns one at a time. Okay, we're going to deal, deal with it one at a time. And so the big focus, what in the world does the word Alma mean, yep. right? What does it even mean? Did the gospel writers uh, abuse it, uh, mistranslate it? Uh, let's just be honest with our sources here too. I think... Uh, a book that's that came out recently that's a very important book is by Christoph Rico and Peter J. Gentry, The Mother of the Infant King, mm. Isaiah 714. And they did a lot of work uh, on on the meaning of Alma and Betula. So it's a it's a book that's it's worth a read. Okay. So but but before the word Alma, we would just want to make clear. What does the word betula actually means? So in modern Hebrew, if you wanted to say virgin, how would you say I would say, say betula. Betula. That's the only word, right? In modern yep. Hebrew, there's no other word yep. to, to refer to a virgin. And so the argument goes, likewise, in modern Hebrew, so in biblical Hebrew, there's only one, one word for virgin, and it's betula, betula. And it's not the word that Isaiah uses. Yeah, he uses alma. Correct. 
So the word Betula, how many times does it appear At in the Hebrew Bible? At least 50 times 50 in times. different versions. Yeah. Okay. Exodus 22, verse 16 uh, in the English, verse 15 in the Hebrew. I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged, Betula, yep. right? And lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. So it's clear that the word here, Betula, means she virgin. Didn't, she didn't know a man. She didn't sleep with anybody yet. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So... Um, there is actually one contested use of Betulan. Again, there's 50, over 50 times that it appears. There's one contested use of the word Betula, uh, and that's in Joel chapter 1, verse mm-hmm. 8. So Joel 1, 8 says, Wail like a virgin, a Betula, girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. So some people would argue that this word, the use of the word Betula here proves that Betula can't mean virgin because how can a, a woman who's a virgin be lamenting the bridegroom of her youth? In yeah. other words, obviously, they were already together. However, however. Yeah, it probably means that she's mourning the loss of her fiancé before. Correct, the, correct. Uh, yeah. so, so we would agree, right, that Betula does in fact mean virgin. Yep. Okay, and that's actually what Rico and Gentry, also they would argue that Betula actually refers to virgin, and in the case of Joel, it actually shows that Betula has no respect for age. So in Hebrew, Betula can mean, Betula doesn't have any respect for age, it's just a virgin woman, Correct. either young or old. Correct, and also in modern Hebrew. Exactly. All righty. So now let's, uh, yeah. this is the debated, <laughs> what alma. about yeah, what, what about is the, the word, word Alma? Alma. Okay. The word is used nine, nine times, times, right? So it's rare. It's not as common as Betula in the Bible. Is it, the word Alma, is it, is the meaning always clear in the Hebrew Bible? Nope. And it's not always clear. And even in, in modern Hebrew, it's not so clear. What do you mean when you say Alma? Is it a young girl? Is she, it doesn't, okay. it's not so clear. So what's really important to notice that it, the word is not used a whole lot in the Hebrew Bible. And there are cases where you simply cannot know what it means because it's used, for instance, for titles in the Psalms. Mm. It doesn't say what they are. So Psalm 46, the superscription, Psalm 68, verse 25, Song of Songs 1-3, 1 Chronicles 15, 20. We don't know. We can't use these to determine yeah, its so, meaning. So in other words, in some, some places where the word Dalma appears, it doesn't say anything about it. It's just a, a title and it doesn't, it doesn't in- interpret it. Correct. Okay. Okay. But, and this is really important, in every clear case, in every clear case, when the word is used, the word refers to a girl who is a virgin. So, for instance, Rebecca, Rebecca in Genesis. Genesis 24, verse 43, she's a virgin. She's a young woman yep. who's not yet married. Exodus 2, 8. Mm-hmm. It's clear that the word there means virgin. Miriam is Moses' older sister, but she's young. Of course. Right? Song of Songs 6, 8. These are cases where the word can be checked. And in these instances, we're dealing with women who are young and virgins. So where's the debate? Okay, where's the debate? Obviously, actually, well, obviously the big debate would be Isaiah 7, 14. But we can't use that, right? But we can't use that because that would be begging the question, right? We can't use our, you know, our our premise to prove the conclusion. So we have one more place. There's one more place, though, um, that the anti-missionaries love to use as proof that uh, Alma does not refer to a virgin. That's in Proverbs 30, verse 19. So that's the proof text. That's the proof text (laughs) that it cannot mean virgin. So what does it say there? So let's read it, okay? Proverbs 30, verses 18 and 19. There are three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Alma. Alma, okay, whatever that means. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Mm. And so I've actually heard some of the anti-missionaries actually say, here, this is proof. What what does a man do with a maid? He sleeps with her and therefore she can't be a, a, a virgin. But there's a problem with that. Just, I want you to notice, number one, we're dealing with poetry. And so there's a, a debate as to what exactly is the point being made? What's too wonderful? And some have actually argued that what's amazing is that the way of an eagle in the sky means that an eagle fly through, flies through the sky and there are no traces He doesn't of leave him. a trace. He doesn't leave a trace. What about a serpent on a rock? Also a serpent on the rock and the sheep on the sea. Doesn't leave a trace. Doesn't leave a trace. And so if... 
this is talking about a man sleeping with a woman, there is a trace. Of course, she would be pregnant. She'd be pregnant. And so the point being that this is a poetic passage and it's actually can be argued in any number of ways. And so we can only rely on those passages that are absolutely clear to make our case. So this is illegitimate. Yeah, this is not a clear text. It's not a clear text. It's a debatable text. Correct. So Golan, why then do you think if we're saying that Alma is a virgin and Betula is a virgin, doesn't that, that's kind of foolish, right? So why, why would you we have two, two words? So there must be a distinction. There must be a difference between those two Hebrew words, right? Correct. And so... So, so what does Rico and Gentry conclude? Okay. So they basically conclude that Alma, in contrast to Betula, relates to a specific period in a woman's life when she is both young and a virgin. Mm. And this is clear in the case of Rebecca. Genesis 24, verse 43, and in the case of Exodus 2, verse 8 with Miriam. So, so, so in other words, not only that uh, Alma is the virgin, it's a young girl, a virgin. A Correct. virgin, a young girl. Correct. A young, a very young woman. Okay? Yep. Correct. So the question then becomes, is there any proof to this interpretation? Mm, from the text itself. So what do we always say? What's the best commentary on scripture? Probably scripture, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the best commentary on scripture is scripture. And I think the best commentary in the meaning of the word alma is in the book of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 54. Because he uses the word alma in a different f- format. The, the same root, but in a, a slightly different. He talks about the period of time when a woman is okay. an alma. The period of her youth, her alumaich. So her... The period of her youth defines what it means to be an alma. So let's just read the whole section. And you're reading from Isaiah 54, 1 to 6. Correct. Shout for joy, O barren one. The barren one here is a metaphor for Zion, Mm -hmm. right? Zion, that that after the exile, she's empty of children. The land of Israel is empty of children. And so this woman has no children. Shout for joy, O barren one, you have been have borne no children. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of than the sons of the married mm-hmm. woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch out the curtains of your dwellings, spare not, lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and resettle the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame, and do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame of your youth. And here's the word alumai. Mm-hmm. This is the period of an alma. This, all right? And the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more, for your husband is your maker whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth, when she is rejected, says your God. And so Mm. what's really important here is that this text actually provides two different reasons for a woman in the ancient world to not have children. In both cases, for a woman... At that time period, not to have children was a disgrace, right? It was it, a shameful it thing. It was shameful at that time period. And so Isaiah actually describes two situations in which a woman would feel shame for not having children. Two, two scenarios. Correct. Okay. So let's look at the first situation in 54 verses 4 mm-hmm. verse A, the first part. Fear not. For you will not be put to shame, and do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame shame of your being an alma. Exactly, the word alma. The shame of your being an alma, the period of your, I don't know how to say it, your youngness, right? Okay. Your youth, yeah. The parallel line provides the solution to this problem. Hmm. 54 verse 5a, for your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. In other words, what is the solution to an alma not having a child? A husband. A husband takes her. And in Hebrew, the word husband actually means the the actual intimate act. Correct. So to become a husband means to make an unmarried woman your wife. Exactly. Now, 
let's look at, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I want you to notice the parallel. 54 verse 4b, and the reproach of your widowhood, almanutaich, you will remember no more. In other words, here's a. there are two scenarios to shame. Yep. The shame of an alma without children and the shame of an almana a widow. without children, a widow. What's the solution to the almana, to the widow? And your redeemer, Goalech, mm-hmm. who is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. In other words, in this situation, God will redeem, he will redeem the widow. In other words, to redeem a widow is to provide children for a woman whose husband husband died Mm -hmm. and she doesn't have a children. So let's stop here because this is really important. In other words, why would a woman, what, what is the shame of an alma in this text? It's that she never had a husband. Nobody ever took her and therefore she never had a child. So alma has to mean according to this Text, a woman that never that, that was never married or was ne- never had a husband. Correct. And that's why she doesn't have a child. Let, let's be clear on this. This is really important. If we're saying that the best commentary on scripture is scripture, mm-hmm. what we're saying here is that Isaiah in this passage def- defines for us what an alma is. An alma is a woman who doesn't have children because she hasn't yet been slept with. She hasn't exactly. yet been taken by a husband. In other words, she's she's a virgin. She's a young virgin. Young virgin. Correct. So let's, I, I think it's worth reading Rico and Gentry's summary mm-hmm. about this passage. It's very well written. The two women will forget forever the shame that they had bitterly suffered, and they will no longer remember the fact that they were without hope of having descendants. The reason for the foreseen absence of progeny for children is different for each of the two women. The first one has been married, but her husband died before she could conceive. So she is in a state of widowhood. Mm -hmm. The state of widowhood will cease as soon as the redeemer, the goel, comes on the scene. As for the second one, she has never had a husband and she is in a state of alumim. This state of alumim, right, being an alma, from the word alma, right, will cease once a bal, a husband takes her in marriage. Mm -hmm. The conclusion to which this strict parallelism leads us is that the word alma can only refer to a girl who has never been married and who has never had children. Mm. Once a Baal, a husband, arrives on the scene, both her celibacy and the absence of children or progeny will cease. So in other words, according to these two scholars, the difference between a virgin and alma is that alma is a young virgin. A virgin could be old or young, but Alma is Alma refers to a young virgin. Correct. Specifically, a young woman who's yet to been take, be taken by a mm. husband. And so, I think that this actually, as we kind of conclude the first response about the meaning of the word Alma, the fact that Alma has to be a woman that has not yet known a man, a young woman who's known a man, makes this text all the more startling. Mm. So... Let, I'm going to read it, and actually, if we look at the Hebrew here, it, there's all sorts of beautiful plays on words here. Mm. So, you're reading Isaiah 7, 10 to 14. Correct. Then the Lord spoke to Ahaz again, saying, Sha'al, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol. So, mm. Sheol, right? Mm-hmm. And so, what's interesting is the word ask and Sheol sound almost exactly the same. And they look almost the same They look the same, exactly. So ask for yourself a sign, make it as deep as Sheol, right? Mm-hmm. Or as high as heaven, Lamala. 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 We're going to get to that in a minute. Yep. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, listen now, O house of David. And by the way, here, he's not speaking just to Ahaz. He's talking to the house of David. Plural, mm-hmm. plural. Listen now, house of David, it is, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a, alma. a virgin is mm-hmm. pregnant. It does not say an alma will become pregnant because that she would not is. be a sign. Yep, she is. But there's an alma who is pregnant. How is it possible 
for an alma who has never slept with a man, who's not been taken by a man, to be pregnant. Yeah. And here we see the beautiful play on words. Is there a connection between alma and as high as heaven? The same, the same words. It's the same words. It's the same letters, just reversed. The same letters, yes. Right? So what is this sign that's as high as heaven? Lamala and alma will is pregnant. Is, and the emphasis on is, it's not tahar, it's hara, it's she is pregnant. Pregnant. Absolutely. And so here we see that this is truly an amazing sign. Amen. So, so we can cl- conclude, f- at least for that part, that the gospel writers did not rip apart the, 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 the translation or the meaning of the Correct. word. They did not distort the meaning of Alma. I think that we see from the book of Isaiah that they actually, that Matthew gets the, the meaning and Luke gets the meaning correctly. Okay, so so we, we tackle the, the meaning of the word Alma, but what about the next argument? What about the context? Did the gospel writers rip out Isaiah 7:14 from its context. Well, so what's the problem with the context? Oh, does it is it a prophecy to be fulfilled or was it fulfilled in Isaiah times? Yeah, so the whole issue of, you know, the context seems to tie Emmanuel's birth to the time period of the Assyrians. And if that's the case, yeah. obviously this can't be about the Messiah. Yep. Obviously, <laughs> right? And so maybe I'll read it Isaiah 7:14 through 20 mm-hmm. just so that we get a sense of the context. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child. Notice I used the word virgin. We mm-hmm. probably should say young virgin, right? Yeah. Young unmarried woman, <laughs> right? Will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Ah, here we go. So Emmanuel had to have been born during the time of the Assyrians, case closed. Yeah. Notice it says, the Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. Again, Assyria. In that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, mm-hmm. they will all come and settle on the steep ravines on the ledges of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes and on all the watering places. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired from the regions beyond the Euphrates, that is with the king of Assyria, Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. And so- Yeah, so Assyria is coming up a lot. So do, do they have a case? Is it, is it, is it the, about the time of Assyria? You know what's- really important here, Golan, and and this is really important, is that when we approach Isaiah 7, obviously the best way to interpret any given passage is in the larger context. And what's really significant, and even the rabbis will admit it, Mm -hmm. that all the messianic prophecies of Isaiah are placed in the context of the days of Assyria. Let me show you what I mean by this. I want you to notice Isaiah chapter 10. Now, mm-hmm. some people would argue, okay, Isaiah chapter 9 is not about the Messiah. We'll do another podcast on that. Okay. So let's, the rabbis do agree that Isaiah 11 is about the Messiah, right? Mm-hmm. Have you checked the rabbinic commentaries? We'll, Isaiah we'll, 11. We'll get to there. Yeah, we'll have, we even have the, the Even the anti-missionaries say, yep. but the immediate context of Isaiah chapter 11 is Isaiah chapter 10. So let's read it. Let's read. All right. Woe to Assyria, and I'm going to start in verse 5 of chapter 10. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. Wait, Assyria again? It's Assyria. (laughs) I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder, to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. For it says... Are not my princes all kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish, or Hamat like Arpad, or Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images, just as I have done to Samaria and her idols? So it will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, Mm -hmm. I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. Now I'm going to skip down to verses 33 and 34. Mm -hmm. Behold the Lord, the God of hosts, 
will lop off the bows with a terrible crash. This is talking about the judgment of the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. He's going to cut down after the judgment when the Assyrians come down and wipe out or, or kind of they're used as God's rod of judgment against the people of Israel. Then God's going to cut down mm -hmm. the bows with a terrible crash. In other words, the Assyrians, those also who are tall in stature will be cut down and those who are lofty will be abased. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron ax and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. And then right after this cutting down of everything, it says in chapter 11, verse one, then when? At After. the judgment of the Assyrians. Exactly. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Another messianic prophecy. The rabbis absolutely don't argue that Isaiah chapter 11, the context, if we were going to take the historical context of Isaiah's days, we would say that this prophecy had to have already been fulfilled. Exactly. And so this whole lopping off... It's it, in some ways too the the parallel story of chapter ten is when the Assyrians come and they're standing outside the gates of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. right? If you remember the commander and yep. he's mocking and and you know where are the gods of this nation and that nation and God intervenes in a miraculous way and rescues Hezekiah. So in some ways you could say that Isaiah eleven looks like Hezekiah, just like you could say that Isaiah nine looks like Hezekiah, or Isaiah 7 looks like Hezekiah, but for the fact that we're dealing with a period of time, these descriptions of this exalted king mm -hmm. and a forever kingdom, it can't be Hezekiah. We could say that the deeds of Hezekiah are a sign for the Messiah. Amen. All right? So, we have, you're saying we have another messianic prophecies, which, which apparently deal in the context of Assyria, but are projecting for a, for, for a later time. Absolutely. So not only does Isaiah tie the birth of the Messiah, right, to the days of Assyria, mm -hmm. we have another classic example in, in Micah chapter 5. Yeah. In Micah chapter 5, which also in rabbinic interpretation... A messianic. It's a messianic, interp it's a messianic prophecy. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah from you. One will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise, that is, this one born mm -hmm. in Bethlehem, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at the time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. When the Assyrian invades our land, when he tramples on, on our own citadels, then he will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men, they will shepherd the land of Assyria yep. with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he will deliver us from the Assyrian when he attacks our land, when he tramples our territory. So it seems like the word Assyria means more than what we think it is. It has to be. It, it has to be. Okay. But another interesting phenomenon that we see are that other messianic prophecies that the rabbis would agree are messianic prophecies mm -hmm are actually tied to the days of Israel's historic enemies. Yep. Numbers 24, 14 and 17 through 19. And now behold, I'm going to my people. Come and I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from, the, uh, from Jacob. Mm -hmm. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy, and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be a possession, Seir its enemies. In other words, this whole use of Israel's past enemies in the context of future prophecies is quite normal yeah, for Rabbi the prophets. Akiva. Rabbi Akiva used that verse as, the, as, as was fulfilled, as the messianic fulfillment on Bar Kochva. Many years later. So Correct. how does that work? Absolutely. And, and there, it, it, there it is. And here we see this whole notion of, what is it? A fava, a fa. Exactly. Unequal it, weights and measures. Unequals weights and measures. So here are the, here's the inconsistencies of the anti-missionaries. One well-known anti-missionary 
I'm going to quote him. <laughs> Isaiah 11 is a messianic chapter. Isaiah 11 verse 1 tells us about the kind of family he, the Messiah, comes from. In the context of Assyria. Correct. And it's still a messianic prophecy. So you tell me, why is Isaiah 11 definitely about the Messiah, even though chapter 10, the context is Assyria, but Isaiah 7 is not about the Messiah. And he's not the only rabbi who agrees that Isaiah 11 is a Messianic prophecy, right? Right. Targum Yonatan in Isaiah 11 verse 1, a king shall come out from the son of Jesse and the Messiah from his son's son shall bear fruit. Uh, Midrash Bereshit Rabbah mm-hmm. and thy staff, that is the Messiah, as it is said in Isaiah 11 1, and there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse. Yeah. And the last, the last reference from the Talmud, Ah, okay, let's see here. Let me see, I have it here. Ah, that's right, from Sanhedrin, Mm -hmm. 93b. The Messiah was blessed with six virtues, as it is written, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And it is written, and his delight, Vayericho, right, from Mm -hmm. Isaiah 11, shall be the fear of the Lord, and he shall neither judge after the sight of his eyes, nor decide after the hearing of his ears. So even the rabbis of the Talmud saw Isaiah 11, even though the context is Assyria, they saw it as a messianic prophecy. So these anti-missionaries can't have it both ways. Mm. In other words, if you're going to say that Isaiah 7 cannot be a messianic prophecy because of the reference to Assyria and the days of Assyria, then Isaiah 11 has to be eliminated too. B- by the way, many of the anti-missionaries are going after the legacy of Rashi, and we have a quote from Rashi on Isaiah 11.1 1 that you can read. Ah, okay. And a shoot, this is what Rashi says mm-hmm. in Isaiah 11.1, 1, and a shoot shall spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and if you say... Here are the consolations for Hezekiah and his people that shall not fall into his hands. Now, what will be the exile that was exiled to Halan Habor? Is their hope lost? Is it not lost? Eventually, the King Messiah shall come and redeem them. Exactly. So, even Rashi here re- understands why this ought to be Hezekiah, right? He It ought to be Hezekiah yeah. because of the context of chapter 10. But Hezekiah becomes a picture of something of somebody so much greater, and the enemy Assyria, it's it, 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 it is is depicted as as an eschatological enemy. It's the, the worst of enemies. Can it's you like, give Can you give an example anywhere where Assyria is used and it's clearly cannot be referring to the the kingdom, the historical kingdom of Assyria anywhere in the Bible? Maybe even in Isaiah. Okay, in Isaiah chapter uh, fourteen, verses twenty two through twenty six, right? Mm-hmm. So notice this is a judgment in the judgment sections, the oracles against the nations. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts. I will cut off from Babylon, name and survivors, offspring and posterity, declares the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the hedgehog Mm -hmm. and swamps of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is sworn saying, surely just as I have intended so, it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand to break Assyria in my land. Mm. And he goes on, but the point is, is that in the book of Isaiah, the kingdom of Assyria and the kingdom of Babylon Babylon. are actually merged so that the fall of Babylon in some ways- Is depicted as the fall of Assyria. Of the the fall of Assyria. Assyria, Or Babylon is an extension of Assyria. And it's it's not the only one, the, the only place in the Bible. In is, there Ezra, an, is there another place in the if, Bible if where Assyria read, absolutely does not refer to Assyria in the days of Isaiah? And that, and in Ezra, the one you're going to read in Ezra is really clear about okay. that. Okay, so Ezra chapter 6, verse 1 for the context, and then we'll skip to verse 22. Mm-hmm. Then King Darius issued a decree... And search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in in Babylon. So King Darius is from the Persian period. So we're talking about three kingdoms later, Assyria, Babylon, Persia. And notice what it says when they observed the Passover in the days of this Persian king. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they observed the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy for the Lord had caused them to rejoice and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria Assyria. toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, 
the God of Israel. So, so again, the name Assyria doesn't necessarily mean the actual Assyrians. It's an eschatological term to mean the enemies, the, the, the most brutal enemies of, 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 of Israel and of God. Sure, and we also have that example, numbers of Amalek, right? This, this, you know, Amalek, even in the book of, of Esther, in the scroll of Esther, you've got Haman, who is this Amalekite. And so, you, you don't have any issue here, again, with using the name Assyria and making the assumption, okay, that proves that it had to be fulfilled in the time period of Isaiah. So in other words, if Isaiah 7 is talking about the, the context of Assyria, it doesn't say, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's not an eschatological event yet to come. Correct. And once again, if the anti-missionaries want to insist that Isaiah 7 is eliminated because they of the to reference be... to Assyria and the kings in those days, they have to they, be consistent. They have to be consistent. So let's throw out Isaiah chapter 11. And yet the anti-missionaries say with confidence that Isaiah 11 is also a messianic prophecy. So I think it's time to sum, to, to sum up the whole, the whole episode. Correct. To see what, what did we find out? Great discussion. So number one, uh, the word Alma, although the anti-missionaries would argue that Matthew and Luke, they basically abuse the text and they, they use the, you know, they don't even know Hebrew or whatever. The word Alma does in fact mean a young virgin. Mm -hmm. It's a young unmarried woman. And that translation is affirmed in Isaiah chapter 54, verses four and five. And so mm -hmm. what we really do have is an incredible miracle that you actually have a pregnant Alma. Exactly. And then secondly, and finally, the New Testament didn't rip Isaiah 7 out of the context. In fact, all of the Messianic prophecies, in the, at least in the first part of the book of Isaiah, are set in the context of the Assyrian context. And this interpretation is affirmed by the way that all Jewish interpreters treat Isaiah chapter and 11. By the way, we see it also in the New Testament in the book of Revelations where Babylon is used as a, as, as a word for an, a future enemy. Correct. Yeah. So there's no issue there whatsoever. And so we see this in Matthew, and I love it. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we've got this birth narrative. It's interesting, we're just coming off a season where around the world... People are all around the world celebrating the, the birth of a, of a Jewish kid. A little Jewish boy, right? <laughs> Which is quite, quite remarkable. But, you know, we can have our readers look at this passage after, but uh, Golan, what do you think, say, would be the take home? What's the application that we can, we can make from what we've just done? I think, at least per personally for me, I can absolutely trust the words of the Gospels. And by the way, when they wrote the Gospels, they had, they had the, the Bible, they had the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament in front of them. They didn't have any other scriptures. So basically what you're saying then is that when Christians hear their faith being assaulted and against the New Testament and the way that the New Testament treats the Hebrew Bible, you're saying that actually that we can trust the way yep. they're interpreting the Hebrew yep. Bible. And, and it's not that we don't welcome. Again, we're talking about a Jewish debate. It's an in-house debate and we welcome the debate. We just want to, uh, to point out that we can trust what the Bible says. And maybe one other application, and that is, is that if you're seeking, if you don't, you've not yet figured out, you're thinking through the Hebrew Bible and whether it does in fact talk about the Messiah and whether Jesus is the Messiah or not, we simply are here to tell you that actually by carefully searching the scriptures, you will know that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Yeah. Amen. And the scripture is rock solid and amen. we trust the rock. Amen, amen. amen. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward to reach others who need to hear this message? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.